Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, 2021 Employee Benefit Compliance Updates. My name is Danielle Mattis, and I will be your presenter today. I am the Manager of Compliance and Client Solutions within Marshall and Sterling's Group Benefits Division, where we help employers to design, implement, and manage comprehensive and personalized employee benefits programs. During today's webinar, I am going to go over key compliance items employers should be aware of in 2021. I'll review some indexed figures and benefit limits, but I'm going to spend the bulk of today's presentation reviewing the impact of COVID-19 and related regulations as this pandemic has certainly had a huge impact on the way employers function and on their compliance obligations. Just some housekeeping items before we get started. I will be recording today's webinar. Also, I'll be sending out the copies of the slide deck at, by tomorrow, you'll get a copy of the slide deck and the recording. And there's a question and answer box where you can type in any questions that pop up during the presentation, and I'll open it up to those at the end of the presentation if time permits. I'll also consider, depending on how many questions we get in, putting a question and answer document together as I've done with other presentations. Under the Affordable Care Act, certain items are indexed each year with inflation. First, I want to go over some employer mandate provisions. So the employer mandate, that's applicable if you have 50 or more FTEs or full-time equivalent employees. And when you are a large employer, you need to offer affordable, compliant coverage to full-time employees. Each year, the affordability percentage when you're determining if that plan offering meets the affordability test is indexed and changed with inflation. It's at 9.83% for plan years beginning in 2021, so up slightly from the 9.78% applicable for 2020. Also, the penalties for failing to comply with the Affordable Care Act either not offering coverage to 95% of full-time employees or penalty A, or offering coverage but it's being defective in some way, either not affordable or not providing minimum value or penalty B, those have been increased to 2,700 and 4,060 respectively. These are annual amounts, but the penalties are assessed on a monthly basis based on the months where there are compliance issues. And if you recall, when the employer mandate first came into effect, the annual amounts were 2,000 and 3,000. So we can see that they have increased quite a bit over the last few years, making compliance more important than ever. When it comes to plan design, uh, health HSA contribution limits have increased for 2021. For single coverage, $3,600 is the annual limit. For family coverage, it's $7,200. The $1,000 catch-up limit is always allowed for those 55 and over. This is statutory, so it doesn't change each year with inflation, but just wanted to put a reminder in that for you. The health FSA limit, or flexible spending accounts, there has been no change from 2020, so the annual limit for that remains at 2,750. The um, fee amount for the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute has increased for 2021 filings. This fee is applicable for employers who sponsor self-insured coverage, including HRAs and certain FSAs. And this is generally due by July 31st of the calendar year following the end of the applicable plan year. For plan years that end in 2020, the PCORI fees will actually be due August 2nd of 2021. That's because July 31st fell on a Saturday this year. Um, but so does a couple extra days you get this year. The fee amounts are up slightly. It's $2.54 per covered life for plan years ending January 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2020. 
and $2.66 per covered life board plans ending October 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020, which would include our calendar plan years. So as always, Marshall and Sterling for our clients will be sending detailed calculations and fee amounts to assist you with the filing. Also just a reminder that the PCORI was originally set to expire um, and 2020 was supposed to be the last filing year, but back in December of 2019, a congressional spending bill brought the PCORI fee back for another 10 years. The Cadillac tax was also repealed under that bill, though, which is seen as a positive by many employers and plan sponsors. I wanted to review the states which have implemented individual mandates and corresponding reporting requirements. Under federal law, all large employers have reporting requirements, the 1094C, 1095C, large employer reporting. But as of the 2020 reporting year, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., California, and Rhode Island have implemented individual mandates. And with that, in addition to federal mandates to require the electronic submission of forms to the IRS, employers and providers of health coverage to residents in these states must file 1095 forms to these states. Connecticut, Hawaii, Maryland, Minnesota, Vermont, and Washington are considering implementing similar legislation and reporting requirements. So just something to keep on the radar if you have employees in these locations. An important update for 2021, of course, is that we've had a change in presidency. And with that, comes changes in terms of the Affordable Care Act. In the last few years, we've had a lot of questions on is the Affordable Care Act going away? When will, you know, would do employers still have to comply? There was a big push in the prior administration to repeal the Affordable Care Act, but within his first month in office, President Joe Biden issued an executive order intended to strengthen the ACA and Medicaid. He directed the department's to review existing policies and determine whether they undermine the ACA and consider whether to suspend, revisit, or rescind those actions. He also directed the HHS to establish a special enrollment period to the federally facilitated exchanges due to COVID, which they did, and that's currently um, going on right now. Also, at the state level in New York, we just saw this week that for New York State of Health, which is New York's health insurance marketplace, the 2021 open enrollment period will be extended through the end of this year. Keep in mind, executive orders are largely symbolic. They don't actually make changes to regulation, but this does serve as an indicator that the ACA is here to stay, so employers should be sure to assess their compliance, as always, uh, within multiple policies and requirements under this law. In late 2020, former President Trump signed the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. This is a huge piece of legislation, but it has multiple provisions which impact employee benefits, including new rules regarding surprise medical billing, new patient choice protections, and new fee dispute resolution process, new rules providing transparency in health care, new continuity of care rules, new rules regarding parity and mental health and substance use disorder benefits, and new reporting requirements regarding pharmacy benefits and drug costs. So most of the above provisions will be coming into effect for plan years beginning on or after January 1st, 2020. And the onus of responsibility is generally going to be on the carrier for fully insured plans. So let's switch gears. We're going to really focus now on the COVID relief and the COVID legislation that's going to come into play for 2021. So the outbreak period is a form of relief impacting deadline extensions under 
in response to the COVID-19 crisis. This was signed by the, or was published by the Department of Labor and the IRS as a joint notice back in April of 2020 to provide relief to benefit plans, plan participants, and service providers impacted by the pandemic. Under the final rule, plans subject to ERISA or the Internal Revenue Code must disregard the outbreak period for determining certain deadlines, including the 30-day or 60-day period to request special enrollment, such as after marriage or after the birth of a child, the 60-day election period for COBRA continuation coverage, the date for making COBRA premium payments, the date for individuals to notify the plan of a qualifying event or determination of disability, the date within which individuals may file a benefit claim under the plan's claims procedure, and the dates within which claimants may file an appeal of benefits determinations or external reviews. So quite a few different timelines, and this is, that's actually just some, there's a few others, but those are the ones most impacting um, you know, employers and employees. And that was going to be you know, a little difficult on its own, but it got a little bit crazier recently. Uh, we thought under federal law that the outbreak period would be limited to one, the, the relief under the outbreak period guidance would be limited to one year. That's because the authority to issue this guidance was within ERISA 518, which limits the relief to a period of one year. Since the outbreak period began on March 1st, 2020, the relief was expected to expire on February 28th, 2021. However, there was a recent notice issued just last month where the agencies clarified that the one-year maximum applies to each individual time period affected by the outbreak period. When you're determining the limit, it runs from the date an action would have otherwise been required in a given situation. So specifically, they state that individuals and plans will have the applicable periods disregarded until the earlier of one year from the date they were first eligible for relief or 60 days after the announced end of the national emergency, which is the end of the outbreak period. So this was uh, kind of big news for employers and service providers because this is going to be an event to event and person by person determination when issues like this arise, determining if timelines have been met because we're going to have to apply these rules to each individual. I want to go over some examples of how this would work. The first one was actually from the guidance themselves itself. If a qualified beneficiary would have been required to make a COBRA election by March 1st, 2020, that requirement is delayed until February 28th, 2021, which is the earlier of one year from March 1st, 2020, or the end of the outbreak period, which remains ongoing. Example two, a COBRA premium payment for March 2020 was due on March 1st, 2020, subject to a grace period ending on March 31st, 2020. The premium was not paid. The one-year period ends February 28th, 2021, and payment can be required by March 31st, 2021. In example three, an employee had a new baby on September 1st, 2021. Per the plan, the employee must enroll their child within 60 days or by August 31st, 2020. The entire one-year maximum period would be told from September 1st, 2020 to August 31st, 2021, and the employee would have 60 days from the end of the one-year tolling period to make this special election special election period election, or October 31st, 2021, assuming, of course, that the outbreak period has not ended at an earlier date. So keep in mind here with those first two examples, we are looking at that date and action would have been due under ordinary circumstances when determining that one-year limit, essentially the last day of action under the normal timeline. And this matters because there is no additional time period to end to add at the end of that one year tolling period. But in example three, we're looking at the beginning. We're looking at day one of the normal time frame, and then we are adding the normal window of time to the end of the tolling period. And this will need to be the approach when determining deadlines once the outbreak period has ended 
as the release duration may be under one year in these cases. Focus the next two slides, we're going to go over the American Rescue Plan Act. This was signed into law just two weeks, about two weeks ago. I think it might actually be two weeks exactly by President Joe Biden. It is a huge $1.9 trillion legislative package, including a significant range of policies to provide pandemic relief, and it contains both mandatory and discretionary provisions relating to employee benefits, including a 100% subsidy for COBRA premiums, which we'll look at in more detail, an extension and expansion of the employee retention tax credit, the extension of pandemic-related unemployment benefits, expansion of subsidy for premiums through the ACA exchanges, and increase in dependent care FSA contribution limits. So the COBRA subsidy, this one's a big one. Uh, just we'll start with an overview. This is a defined period for this subsidy. So we'll call that the subsidy period. And it's for April 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2021. The subsidy is only available for coverage lost due to involuntary termination or reduction in hours. This is a 100% subsidy. The original version, the draft version, called for an 80%, but the, the published version and final version is 100%. So qualified beneficiaries will pay nothing. Um, the entity that individuals would have normally paid COBRA premiums to will essentially advance those amounts due. And employers will recover lost premium through a payroll tax credit generally. And previously eligible individuals who are not currently enrolled in COBRA will have a second chance to enroll and there are significant new notice requirements under the COBRA subsidy. Any group health plan covered by federal continuation coverage or state continuation coverage except for flexible spending accounts are considered eligible plans for the COBRA subsidy. The COBRA premium and the subsidy will include medical, dental, vision, HRAs, and the standard 2% COBRA administration fee. These rules are not optional for employer-sponsored group health plans. So all group health plans subject to COBRA except FSAs must provide this subsidized coverage. First step when determining how this applies is identifying assistance eligible individuals or AEIs. And these are qualified beneficiaries who trigger COBRA continuation coverage because of an involuntary termination of employment or a reduction in hours and whose current COBRA continuation coverage period would cover some or all of the subsidy period. Individuals who qualify for COBRA because of voluntary termination, retirement, or death would not be considered an AEI. An AEI is no longer eligible for a subsidy upon the earliest of either becoming eligible for other group health plan coverage, becoming eligible for Medicare, or the expiration of their maximum COBRA period. AEIs are required to notify their group health plan if they become eligible for other ACA compliant coverage during the subsidy period, even if they choose not to enroll in that, and they will be subject to penalties if they fail to do so. Important piece here is that coverage is not automatic. So any AEI that is not yet enrolled in COBRA will still need to elect COBRA coverage and take that action to take advantage of the subsidy they aren't going to just be automatically enrolled because they're eligible for the subsidy. For those who aren't currently enrolled, 
I know we mentioned there's a second chance. That's going to be the COBRA subsidy special enrollment period. So an individual who is eligible for assistance but hasn't elected COBRA coverage by April 1st or who elected but then discontinued it, either they just jumped off the plan, they stopped paying, um, they may elect COBRA coverage during a special enrollment period, which will start April 1st and end 60 days after the date on which the COBRA subsidy notification was delivered. And these individuals may receive the subsidy on a prospective basis without having to elect and pay for COBRA retroactively for months prior to the subsidy becoming available. This is huge because usually there is not a gap in coverage when it comes to COBRA. So allowing employees and assistance eligible individuals to really just take advantage of the COBRA subsidy period without having to elect backwards is a huge change. Employers may but are not required to permit individuals to change coverage at that time. Um, if this option is provided, the premium subsidy cannot exceed the cost of the coverage option that the individual was enrolled in at the time of the qualifying event. Some examples of how this might look. So Gary was laid off due to a company downsizing in December of 2019. He became eligible for COBRA on January 1, 2020. Gary never elected COBRA. He may be eligible for subsidized COBRA between April 1, 2021 through June 30, 2021. This is because if he had elected COBRA beginning January 1, 2020, he would have reached his 18 months maximum coverage at the end of June. However, if Gary already found another job and was eligible for health insurance through his new employer, he would not qualify for subsidized COBRA. Jan, example two, we have Jan. She lost eligibility for health insurance through her job after her hours were reduced due to COVID. She became eligible for COBRA on July 1st, 2020. However, Jan never elected COBRA and is still working part-time. Jan may be eligible for subsidized COBRA between April 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2021. That would be the full COBRA subsidy period. That's because if she had elected COBRA beginning July 1st, 2020, she would reach the 18 months maximum coverage on December 31st, 2021. Note, she could continue to stay on COBRA after the subsidy period ends, but at that point, she would be paying the premium on her own. Also note that the one, that the Department of Labor's one-year COBRA election extension would apply to Jan. So that outbreak period we talked to about just a couple slides ago, she would have had the option to elect COBRA back to July 1st, 2020, but she would have to pay the premiums owed for retroactive coverage prior to the subsidy period. So they can either, employees can choose to prospectively enroll in COBRA starting for the duration of the COBRA period, or if they go back, Using the outbreak period relief, they'll just have to cover the cost before the subsidy period. We are hoping, though, that there'll be more information coming out regarding the, there certainly will be a lot more information coming out regarding the COBRA subsidy and implementation and guidance. And I assume and hope for more clarification regarding the interplay between the COBRA subsidy period and the outbreak period. In addition to the COBRA general notice and election requirements that are already required, employers will have additional notice requirements to assistance eligible individuals and new language to include as part of the COBRA election notice for newly eligible participants. The Department of Labor has been directed to provide the model language within 30 days of enactment of the um, ARPA, and then providers will have 60 days to provide the notices to AEI. So I think that puts us at April 10th is, is when the 30-day limit would be, so we should be seeing these within the next few weeks. The big notices are the premium assistance notice. This is going to go to individuals who are already active, who are assistance eligible individuals, but they're active on the COBRA continuation coverage. So it's just notifying them how you're enrolled in the COBRA coverage, we've identified you as being an assistance eligible individual, and you're, you will have this period where COBRA will be at no cost to you. 
Um, I've gotten a few questions about what if people have already sent in their April payment. They will have to be refunded. If they're identified as an assistance eligible individual and they send in their COBRA premium payment for April, that will have to be refunded to them. Election notices will be required to individuals who qualify for the new 60-day special election period or those who have yet to elect COBRA but remain eligible to do so under the usual rules. So that will be notifying them about the subsidy period and their new option to enroll at this point. There will also be subsidy termination notices that are due to individuals who are receiving the subsidy, letting them know when the subsidy will end. So the big questions, the bigger questions that have been coming in are regarding the tax credit and payment of these COBRA subsidies, the cost of keeping an employee on the plant on COBRA and then how people are going to be paid back. So the cost of the COBRA premium is claimed as a refundable tax credit by the entity covering the cost of the subsidized coverage. Under the current regulations, and we expect to have a lot more guidance, um, the person who is defined as covering the cost and receiving the subsidy uh, for a multi-employer plan, it's the plan itself. If the plan is subject to federal COBRA or a, a self-funded plan subject to state continuation, then the employer maintaining the plan and for fully insured state continuation coverage, the insurer. The payroll tax credit will equal the full amount of COBRA premiums not paid by assistance eligible individuals. And if the amount of the credit exceeds the payroll taxes owed, any access will be refunded to the eligible entity. And again, that, that premium tax credit is going to include the standard 2% COBRA fee. The credit may be advanced under rules set out by the IRS, and the IRS will be forthcoming with the necessary regulations, guidance, forms and instructions to carry out these payroll tax credits, including any reporting required to verify the amount of reimbursement. Keep in mind that employers cannot claim a tax credit for COBRA subsidies on amounts they plan to receive a tax credit through for the employee retention credit or through the FFCRA. So no double dipping, no getting um, credit back for the same expense more than once. And while we are awaiting much guidance on how to implement these COBRA subsidies, including all the notices and filing this, something that plan administrators and employers can do now is to coordinate and establish a plan for determining who assistance eligible individuals are and how they're going to track the amount of subsidies that are provided um, during the subsidy period. The CARES Act has a provision known as the Employee Retention Credit. This is a refundable payroll tax credit designed to encourage eligible employers to keep employees on their payroll despite experiencing economic hardship related to COVID-19. The American Rescue Plan Act has expanded this, so I want to go over some basics on the credit and then I'll talk a little bit more on some of the expansions under the ARPA. So the credit the ERC provides a refundable credit of up to $5,000 for each full-time equivalent employee retained between March 13th and December 31st, 2020, and up to $7,000 per quarter for each retained employee between January 1st and December 31st, 2021. So that's just $5,000 for the full period of 2020, but the $7,000 per quarter for 2021 means that eligible employers could potentially take an ERC of up to $33,000 per employee. An eligible employer is one who is ordered to fully or partially shut down, or one whose gross receipts fell below 50% for the same quarter in 2019, and that 50% is applicable for 2020, or below 80% for 2021. For employers not in business in 2019, corresponding quarters from 2020 can be used to determine eligibility. 
qualified wages includes wages and compensation, as well as amounts paid by the employer for the employee's group health plan coverage. As long as those costs, of course, aren't being claimed under another form of relief or credit. And employers may claim their credit immediately by reducing payroll taxes sent to the IRS where credits exceed payroll taxes, a direct refund can be requested from the IRS. So the ARPA extended and expanded the employer retention credit. So originally it was set to be just for 2020. The Consolidated Appropriations Act extended it to the first two quarters of 2021, and then the ARPA extended the credit to the last two quarters of 2021. The ARPA also expanded eligibility for the ERC to recovery startup businesses, or those established after February 15, 2020, with annual gross receipts of up to $1 million. And a recovery startup business will meet the ERC eligibility test, even if it does not otherwise meet the general eligibility requirements. But the credit here is capped at $50,000 per quarter per employer. The IRPA also increases the amount of the credit, the employer retention credit, available to employers who are severely financially distressed which is defined as those who experience a gross receipts reduction of more than 90% as compared to the same quarter in 2019. For severely financially distressed employers, the employer retention credit is uncapped, um, and these employers may treat all wages paid to employees as qualified wages, regardless of their size and number of employees. So important to note that the IRS recently issued some question and answer guidance, as well as a um, other guidance on the 2020 ERC qualified wages and, and pay and applying for the credit, but this only applies to wages paid um, before December 31st, 2021. So it's expected that the IRS guidance regarding 2021 ERC updates will be forthcoming and will certainly you know, update you as, as more information becomes available. So just a quick overview on some other employee benefit provisions included in the American Rescue Plan Act. The extension of pandemic-related unemployment benefits has been issued under that until September 6, 2021, so that's the extra $300 in weekly benefits. And in addition, the first $10,200 of unemployment benefits are exempted from federal income tax for each spouse and household with under $150,000 in gross income. There has also been an expansion of subsidy amounts for ACA premiums through the ACA exchanges. So the bill increases the dollar amount of and eligibility for subsidies for health insurance coverage purchased through the marketplace exchange. And these and other ACA affordability changes made by the bill will expire after two years. Keep in mind that these are separate from employer requirements under the employer mandate. I had a few questions on if the change in affordability percentages on the exchanges would impact the employer requirements, and they do not, unless there is a second bill or something else that comes out. But as it stands, this is specific to the marketplace. Also, there was an increase in dependent care flexible spending account contribution limits. So for calendar year 2021, the annual contribution limit for these programs has been increased from $5,000 to $10,500, and employers may retroactively amend their plan to incorporate this increase. So this is a permissive change, but certainly nothing that's required. All right. So that concludes everything I wanted to cover with you today. I am checking my Q&A box. I definitely wanted to leave some time to go over questions. I know there's certainly um, has been a lot coming in at this point. So let's check through. I have one that I see so far. Um, do we have to send notices on or before 
April 1st, 2021 to those employees that were terminated, laid off if they qualify for this new subsidy? No. So the you'll have 60 days to send the notice out after it's issued by the Department of Labor. So we're still waiting on the model notices. Those don't exist yet, but the Department of Labor is required to issue those under, under the ARPA. And once those are issued, then plan sponsors will have 60 days to determine, to you know, have their, those sent out, determine their AEIs and get those sent out to the right people. Is the ACA affordability percentage change from 9.78% to 9.83% for employer medical plan that meets ACA affordability coverage or only marketplace plans? So the 9.83%, that is the employer mandate affordability percentage. So that is very specific to what an employer is determining, is this offer of coverage that I am sending out to my employees affordable, that changes a little each year, um, but the, and any change to marketplace eligibility by lowering that threshold at this point will not impact employer compliance. You can continue to use the amounts that are specific to the employer mandate. If an employee's child is aging out and is offered COBRA, do they qualify for the subsidy also? So that's a good question. The general consensus is no, because the the subsidy is available only to those who were voluntarily terminated or had their hours voluntarily reduced, in, involuntarily terminated, pardon me, they, they were either involuntarily terminated or their hours were involuntarily reduced. So the understanding is that that's just employees. They could have qualified beneficiaries who are impacted by that that could be eligible for the subsidy if at the time of that involuntary reduction in hours or involuntary termination, there was you know, employee and spouse on the plan, but it's not going to apply to aging out. Um, we are expecting that the Department of Labor is going to issue questions and answers. So I think that's something that will probably be you know, solidified in more detail, but right now that is the consensus is that this is just going to be employee. What if you are not in a calendar year for the DCA? Does the increase still apply? Yes, the increase still applies if you, and you would work with your vendor to determine you know, exactly when to retroactive that back to and how to apply that to your specific plan year. Um, but when there's increases in limits, that would apply to, to your plan year. And let me see. I don't see any more questions coming in. If, oh, so I got one more. Should we be looking at our involuntary terminations back 18 months for the COBRA subsidy notices? So this is um, a very good question as well. Something that we're really, really hoping for in the Department of Labor guidance that's coming is the interplay with state continuation. In New York State, obviously, the maximum coverage period can be 36 months for anyone because they get the, if you're subject to federal COBRA because there's the 18 month federal period and then the 18 months for the New York state. Um, the understanding now and in examples I've seen is using, looking back 18 months. So I think that was November, looking back to like November 1st of 2019 and involuntary termination from then until um, April 1st to figure out who an assistance eligible individual is. But if we're also having to look 36 months back for those who could be in their maximum 36 month period, um, you know, that would really complicate things. I, I, there's not guidance specifically addressing that at this point, but right now the assumption is that yes, you'd be looking back 18 months to determine anyone who was involuntarily terminated or had an involuntary reduction in hours. And of course, this is not every single person that, um, that had that happened to them, only those who would have been eligible for COBRA based on that reason. So not someone for gross misconduct, not someone who wasn't enrolled in the plan at the time of the termination. Um, none of that, you know, those people wouldn't be. It's just going to be anyone who is eligible for a COBRA election period um, within the last 18 months due to a involuntary reduction in hours or involuntary termination. 
if a terminated employee had coverage for self and spouse, do both the former employee and spouse qualify for COBRA subsidy coverage or just the employee? So both. So it's going to be the type of COBRA, the type of coverage that the employee had at the time of the qualifying event. So whenever we're going to be looking at what level of coverage were they in when they experienced that COBRA qualifying event, they won't be able to, you know, add it's my understanding now, it could be something that's issued later, there won't be the ability to change their coverage level to add a new spouse for the COBRA subsidy period. But if that spouse would have been eligible for COBRA at the time of the event, then yes, the, that spouse would be eligible for the subsidy. Can you clarify if the employee is terminated and had the family coverage, is the employer responsible to pay the family premium or just the single individual premium? So this is going to be similar to the last question in that it's going to be the full premium for whatever the employee elects. So keep in mind that any qualified beneficiary is not going to be eligible for the subsidy if they are eligible for other group health insurance or Medicare. So depending on who those COBRA qualified beneficiaries are at the time of the COBRA qualifying event, if they were enrolled, you know, at, in the health plan, the subsidy will cover them if they're subsidy eligible. So they're not enrolled in one of those other plans. So yes, the family premium would be covered if all those individuals are AEIs and elect to, to continue COBRA. And I think the last question I got is I joined the webinar late. Can I, can I watch the recording? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we will be recorded. This, this has been recorded. I'll be sending out the copies of the slide and the recording to everyone who registered within the next day or so. And if any other questions come up between then or within the next coming weeks, please feel free to reach out. My email is and phone number are on the cover slide. Um, so you can reach out to me if anything else comes up. And that's all the questions I'm seeing for today. So thank you again for joining us. I hope you found this webinar helpful and that you have a great rest of your day.